Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Dark Souls Dissected. I wanted to talk about object health, or object defense values, or whatever you want to call it. It's what governs how breakable objects work in Dark Souls. You may have noticed before that most breakable objects just let you roll right through them, but then you get to somewhere like the Duke's Archives, and suddenly you're being asked to actually attack everything. There's a pretty simple system behind all of this, but it allows for some bizarre shenanigans that are hilarious, and sometimes actually helpful for the speedrunning community. Basically, we're going to see every possible method of breaking through the wall to Logan in Sense Fortress, as there's more than just the boulder and snake guy that can break it open. So to start with, all objects have both a defense value and an HP value. The HP value doesn't mean anything too specific on its own, and you can think of it as more like a binary sort of thing. If something is breakable, it typically has 1 HP, and if it's completely unbreakable, then it has negative 1 HP. There's a few weird outliers, but we'll ignore those for now. Then there's also an object's defense value, which is where there's further specificity on exactly how durable an object is. All objects in this game will have a defense value of either 0, 3, 90, 199, or 999. Now, as you can imagine, different attacks from both the player character and enemy mobs will all have their own object damage values, and if they exceed these amounts, then they're capable of breaking them. This is referred to as attack object in the parameters. I'll show some more examples of these in a moment, but we can see how the developers put in a bunch more numbers than were necessary. All of the possible attack object amounts from the player character are the numbers you see here, and enemy mobs are only ever capable of these amounts here. When we compare these to all of the defense values possible, we see that enemies have a couple redundant values, and the player character has five redundant values. What I mean is that there are no unique objects that require any of these to be broken. Any objects these values can break can also be broken by the next weakest attack available. So this level of specificity never gets used by the game in any way. You could mod every attack that's set to one of these highlighted numbers to become 5 as well, and nothing in the game would change. If you're wondering why they would bother with all these extra numbers, it wasn't actually a bad idea. Earlier in the development process, they wouldn't have had a crystal clear picture on how many different kinds of objects they would need, and if they would ever want something that could withstand medium attacks but not a variety of stronger attacks. In the end, everything in the middle that the player is capable of wound up being unnecessary, but it didn't hurt them to have them at the ready if they found a use for it. Speaking of which, here's a few examples. A lot of weaker attacks, like one-handed dagger attacks, punching things, or even attacking while on a ladder, are mapped to that first extra unnecessary value of 10. You'll see some medium-sized weapons generally hover around 20 object damage, but in some cases a stronger attack from the same weapon, like a two-handed running attack, might spill over to 40 object damage. Then you'll see some bigger weapons defaulting to 40, with their stronger attacks outputting 60 object damage. And 80 attack object damage starts popping up with things like Great Axes and Ultra Great Swords. There's not actually much from the player that only does 5 object damage. Uh, in my previous video on Poise, I briefly talked about how some of the Lightning Miracles have a descending damage in a rare AoE that only happens when you hit water. And it's in the Outer Rings where most of our 5 damage values pop up. So any objects that are fragile to this would also crumble from a slight shock in water. So I'd like to review some objects at each defense amount, but we have a sort of outlying category that's even weaker than zero defense. Some objects simply have a flag that tells them to break if the player merely touches them, so you don't even have to roll or attack them at all. This most fragile category applies to stuff like the thin branches in the Great Hollow, and also the branches you slide through on your way to the Bed of Chaos. If we disable this flag, it turns out we wouldn't totally get stuck here, but it looks pretty funny and you have to hold the direction to slide out of the way. So this applies to the skeletons found in the Catacombs, and the Tomb of the Giants. It turns out it also applies to the skeletons hanging in Pinwheel's room. Most of these are too high off the ground to interact with by walking into them, but it's possible if you drop down from above. Then from here, the only other things that work this way are the poop jar in the Undead Asylum, and some out-of-bounds planks you can't normally reach, which are found at a cut entrance to the depths. The bucket in the starting cell is also supposed to break when simply walking into it, but it appears that they entirely forgot to include any collision for it. 
so despite being designed to be breakable, there's no way for us to make contact with it. Going up from here, we have all of the zero defense objects that don't have that previous flag turned on. So you have to attack the object in some way, but rolling qualifies for that. It's among your weakest attacks possible, only dealing one object damage to just barely surpass that. There's a few things in here I was a little surprised by. I think I usually attacked Cease Crystal, but you can actually just roll through that too. The same goes for the crumbling brick wall in the catacombs, the breakable door in the painted world, and the item corpse hanging from a rope in Ulasil Township. None of these require a stronger attack. The same goes for illusory walls. Most illusory walls. Here's where things got a little weird. The illusory wall in Sense Fortress that leads to the gate opening giant is unique in that it's the only illusory wall that can't be broken by rolling. This is because it jumps up to the next tier of object defense, which is three. I don't think there's any particular reason for making the Sense Fortress Illusory Wall unique in this regard. I suspect that they just copied the wrong value over, or forgot exactly how weak it was supposed to be, and picked the second weakest thing instead by accident. This puts it in the same category as all of those annoying tables and chairs that we can't just roll through in the Duke's Archives. And the same defense value applies to almost all of the other objects in the Duke's Archives as well, like the Astrolabe and Mobile Stairs. While I wasn't particularly interested in examining every single breakable object in the game, uh, because there's a ton of them, I did want to look closely at everything that can't just be rolled through, to see what might be surprising or unexpected, and everything that's three defense and up. Other stuff you can still break, but can't roll through, includes the regular tables and benches in the depths, the butcher's table, one random cart in the undead parish, and the cursed statues of other players. But it gets a little weird here too. Andre's wooden stump that he sits on, and his anvil, are another breakable three defense object. There's a variant of this object with the same values on top of the Moonlight Butterfly's tower, and that one behaves as expected. But with Andre, they went out of their way to implement some protection against shenanigans. Oh yes. To start with, when he aggroes, he automatically breaks it by standing up. But he just kind of switches from his hammering animation to his angry idling animation, and there isn't a hitbox from him that invokes any kind of object damage. Secondly, if we were to carefully attack and hit only the anvil but not Andre, if it was breakable as it should be, that would cause a funny instance of Andre just hammering on nothing mid-air. But this isn't possible either. It actually won't break from any of our attacks. This is because they put in a special event that overrides all of that. It's what makes it both invincible from us, and breakable to Andre when merely standing up, even though he doesn't properly hit it in the process. We will see events apply to some other breakable objects later on as well, but those all have a more apparent reason for doing so. So I think this might be the only object protected by a special event in this way. There's also a few other three defense objects that are a bit funny. There's the collapsible segment of floor found in Blight Town. It's well understood that falling onto it will break it, which makes sense when we consider that our falling animation has an object attack value of 10, surpassing 3 no problem. But it doesn't have the player collide flag enabled. So I was wondering, what causes this floor to simply collapse by walking on it? Another special event? Actually, that doesn't happen. I'm sure a lot of viewers must have known this already, but this was a surprise to me. I think I just learned to avoid the spot a long time ago, and never realized you can just step onto it from level ground. This means it doesn't have any kind of special event that helps break it, and it is, in fact, entirely at the mercy of object defense and HP mechanics. There's nothing inherently wrong with doing it this way, but it can lead to some funny situations where it really feels like we're tempting fate. For starters, rolling is only one object damage, so it survives that just fine. Even heavy rolling. Consumable weapons don't ever seem to do more than one object damage as well. This means we can throw knives and firebombs at it while we're standing on it, and we'll be just fine. This means that you also can't break all of that furniture in the Duke's archives with black firebombs. If you asked me before making this episode, I would have assumed that would work but apparently not. Now, as you start doing attacks that are pretty much any amount stronger, even including a barehanded punch, that makes the difference in being able to smash it and fall through. But you know what still doesn't work, surprisingly? Arrows. They were all also set to only do one object damage. And when I say arrows, I mean all arrows. So yeah, this all looks pretty absurd if we compare this to changing our Y coordinate to the smallest amount possible higher to trigger a falling animation. Like all that heavy rolling and great arrows do nothing to this platform, but this works. The last remaining three defense object is the giant chandelier in Anor Londo. I noticed in the data that it's actually comprised of a couple different objects. Or is that three different objects? 
It's a bit complicated, but just know that the chain isn't the only part that was set to break, and all parts only have three defense. Now, normally hitting only the chandelier and not the chain makes the whole thing collapse regardless, but I was determined to see if there were any loose ends caused by making each individual part breakable. Sure enough, awkwardly clipping up through the bottom of it allows us to break just the chandelier part and not the chain part. This causes the item corpse and a few fragments to remain floating in the air. And then we can attack it a second time and watch the whole thing fall again. There are technically a few other objects that have their defense set to 3, but it's just an irrelevant mistake. The Blighttown Water Wheel, Door to the Kiln, and the Duke's Archives Alarm were all set to 3 defense as well, but that doesn't mean that they were ever meant to be breakable. They all have an HP of negative 1, making them invincible. As you can imagine, most non-breakable objects just have a defense of 0 and an HP of negative 1, because it doesn't make sense to set a more specific defense if it's going to be completely unbreakable anyways. But there's a few places where it just seems to pop up as a mistake that doesn't really affect anything. If we mod their HP to make them breakable, you'll see what happens to objects that weren't designed to be broken. They'll just instantly vanish from sight, showing that it really wasn't meant to work this way. So moving forward, I'll be ignoring anything else like this, since it doesn't really count as valid examples of a given defense amount. That covers all of the weaker objects, so now we're on to 90 defense objects. These are the objects that are normally too strong for us to break, but stronger enemy attacks will take them down. So unsurprisingly, we usually encounter this by a few bosses and mini-bosses, where the intention was to give them some interaction with their environment. We have the pillars in the Gaping Dragon's room, the pillars by Ornstein and Smo, the pillars in the Undead Asylum, the pillars by the Heavy Knight, the rock formations by Manus, and the statues by the Chained Prisoner. By the way, each pillar in the Ornstein and Smo room is actually made up of four individual objects that can all be broken separately. But that's not everything. 90 object defense also applies to a few breakable walls, like the ones in the Asylum and Sen's Fortress. And this is where things get pretty interesting for speedrunning. I said that 90 defense is normally too strong for us to break, which is why we're usually relying on stronger traps or enemies to do our work for us. But we actually do have one attack that's capable of breaking them open, which is our spawning animation. When you load into the game, you have an animation of standing up, and this was set to do 100 object damage. This was presumably done to help avoid getting stuck in some of these walls or pillars, and a video by Zuli the Witch shows how the wall in Sense Fortress is able to be broken by simply reloading the game while standing there. Well, it wasn't that simple, because Zuli did a lot of trial and error until it somehow just glitchily worked after a ton of attempts. But under normal circumstances, the game doesn't let you reload close enough to the wall to break it. There's a patch of what's considered unstable ground right in front of it. Unstable platforms are places where the game won't save your location when you quit and reload, like the rotating staircases of Inner Londo and the Duke's Archives. You'll always get pushed back to your point of entry. You may have noticed that Bloodstains also won't follow you onto unstable ground, and we can use this to help visualize the issue with the Sense Fortress wall. Here I've toggled on a Bloodstain visualizer. It displays one in real time underneath our feet, showing where a Bloodstain can follow us. Then there's also one chasing us on a 10 second delay, which is what would be the actual location of your bloodstain the moment you die. Walking onto unstable ground shows that the bloodstain refuses to follow us, and it fails to follow us closely enough for the respawn trick to work against the sense fortress wall. But I'm going to show a really crappy method that I figured out on my own, followed by a speedrunning solution that is brilliant and way cooler. So for my crappy, easy method, I noticed that the object for this breakable wall isn't just where the hole opens up. It's actually this entire back wall. So I wondered if I could approach it from anywhere else, and found this ledge off to the side. And yeah, that actually works. So just hop on down here, and quit and reload while against the wall, and it'll explode the moment you respawn. Here you might be thinking, okay, but now what? Now you have to use a homeward bone or dark sign to get out of here, but uh, no, actually. You might be surprised to learn that this is a survivable fall. There is no kill box here for a guaranteed death. And the subtle height difference between this side ledge and the main walkway straddle the boundary of the highest survivable fall possible. So you will die from here with full health, but not from here. I thought that was a pretty funny set of coincidences to make breaking the wall from here viable, but landing with low health by a Titanite demon in the tar pit and having to climb back out from there is way more effort than just moving the boulder trap yourself, and probably more time consuming. Not to mention just getting the snake to break it for you. So if anyone wants to do this for the sake of it, knock yourself out, but it's not exactly helpful. But the speedrunning demonstration from Catalyst shows a much cooler way of doing it, and I'll let him explain it in his own words. 
We need to free Logan in order to progress his questline and obtain stronger sorceries for the run. He is trapped behind this breakable wall. The same glitch from the asylum can be utilized to break it, but simply walking up to it and quitting out is not possible, as the ground next to it has an unstable property. This means it would not store our position. Instead, we will drop on a cage right next to it and then jump directly towards the wall, getting past the unstable ground and being able to break it standing up right next to it. You've got to be kidding me. I sort of gave up trying to recreate it, because he made that look a lot easier than it actually is. You'll notice that he jumps from on top of this cage door to the wall, but there's not really enough room to run and jump. What he does is he jumps from a standing still position to make that possible, and jumps don't work that way in Dark Souls. In reality, he is building up to the jump while landing on the cage, but that's a whole process in and of itself. It's really impressive. From here, recreating the jump with cheating by flying and debug still makes it appear as if we're on unstable ground. But for a split second, when we move back to stable ground, we see it quickly blip from against the wall. So apparently this does trick the game into registering that as your most recent location, allowing the respawn trick to work. The same speedrunning trick is also used in the tutorial, and there it's much, much easier uh, because there's no unstable ground getting in your way. So yeah, this means that for any of those other pillars I mentioned earlier, if you can get close enough to them, they'll break upon respawning next to them, too. But is there anything else that can break this stuff, and do we have any other ways to get to Logan? I mentioned the snake's attack, and it just so happens that its thrust attack was set to do 100 object damage. I think this might have been intentional, and they might have considered this as an alternate method to the boulder, but that's a complete guess. If we start digging through all enemy and player attacks, we'll find other things that also do 100 object damage. But this mostly belongs to enemies that aren't in Sense Fortress, or are nowhere nearby, so there's not much to choose from. The player's knockback animation is something else that works. We can see it smash the wall here when I force that animation on my character. This means running into someone else in PvP provides some more opportunities to break the wall if they can do anything that does a full knockback. Or if you could manage to lure Sigmire into the right position after aggroing him, that would work too. The snake's knockback animation also works for this, so anything that can cause that is also viable. Just note that the straight knockdown animation doesn't seem to work. If you try googling some more ways to break the wall, you might find some outdated sources claiming that the special attack of the Drake Sword can break the wall open. But the real reason that's only working is because of the snake being thrown backwards. Sorry Drake Sword, no snake, no break. I also noticed that the Mimic has some 100 object attack values as well. So in what might be the worst and most inefficient way of breaking the wall, you could kill the boulder giant so the boulders stop rolling, aggro the Mimic and have it chase you all the way there, run by the boulder lever and ignore the fact that we should have just used that instead, and then you pray you don't get eaten or that it doesn't fall to its death while you try to bait its kick attack. Good luck to anyone who tries it. Uh, at least it might still be easier than the Siegmeier method. So come into the cage and become Nana's shade. Now the second breakable wall down by the gold serpent ring also has some issues with unstable ground, and it also has a pit blocking it that would make most enemy attacks difficult to achieve here. But since the knockback animation still works, just letting yourself get hit by the boulder is viable. And this is also something that's helpful for the all achievement speedrun. There's also just a few more 90 defense ledges that are breakable as well. It's fairly well known that the Asylum Demon can jump up and break the platform if you stand there for too long. What's happening here is that this is the only object that is uniquely set to 199 defense. And while all of the other highest enemy attacks only do 100 object damage, the Asylum Demon's jump attack is the one and only thing to do 200 object damage. So they really didn't want anyone besides the Asylum Demon to break that platform. Somewhat lesser known is the fact that you can jump to a couple smaller platforms in the corner, and these can also be smashed. But these once again only have 90 defense instead of 199 like the main platform. Respawning here would break these too, though Unstable Ground tries to prevent that. In trying to figure out if there was a viable way, Rhesus from the server name Discord showed us a method where you can jump behind the statue to get out of bounds, and then reload to break it from back there. The last set of objects are the ones that have 999 defense and 999 HP. 
I think they went a bit overboard, making the HP that high as well, and I'm not sure what purpose that serves, since 999 defense is more than enough to protect them from all player and enemy attacks. But the way these work is that they all have scripted events that are given special instructions to break. Most of them are breakable floors that get triggered from simply occupying the right region, like all of the drop paths in the catacombs, the skeleton trap by the Dark Moon Ring, the drop away entrance to the stray demon, the Chaos Eater Pit, and all of the segments of floor in the Bed of Chaos Arena. And it's also used for the statue of Gwyn that vanishes. A similar script could have been applied to the platform in Blight Town if they wanted just walking on it to work there, too. There are a few remaining oddities, though. Earlier I showed how changing the HP of unbreakable objects basically never works and just results in vanishing. That raises the question if there are any exceptions. Was anything designed to be breakable, but they might have changed their minds on? As it turns out, if we count everything that isn't completely unused, there should just be three examples of this in the entire game. The first one here I learned about from that same Zuli the Witch video I mentioned earlier. The statues of the gargoyles on the parish rooftop have a defense of just 90, but this was locked out by making the HP infinite. Modding this allows us to see them crumble apart with our spawning animation. And as Zuli noted, it doesn't have a working sound effect. Then there's also these torches in Blight Town. Seeing this works after we mod it is a bit of a stretch, but at least something is happening beyond vanishing. It like breaks in half or something, or the top half gets cut off to make it shorter. I'm not really sure what's happening, but it looks unfinished. Lastly, we also have this very specific segment of wall near the Chaos Covenant shortcut to Lost Isolith. At one point in development, they considered having a rockworm smash through this wall, and we'd be able to find an item back there as well. You can see more about this in my Out of Bounds video. Despite being an unfinished or unused event, the segment of wall that is considered an object and not just normal terrain is still here in the final game. So modding makes it breakable as well, and we can even go inside. And again, all these mods were no more complicated than changing these objects' HP from negative 1 to 1. We can point to a few other oddities, like how among the redundant values of enemy attacks, Chester is the only enemy in the entire game to have an object attack value of 20, with his kick attack. You'd think that by the time the DLC existed that they wouldn't need to bother with any of the redundant values, but they made an entirely new one for him that doesn't help break anything in particular. Maybe they were trying to use some values that match the player character's attacks, but it was still a completely pointless number to add into the mix. There's also some more anomalies in terms of what's breakable versus what has infinite HP, but you have to start digging around unused content for that. You'll commonly find numbers of things that spilled over from Demon Souls but aren't really in the game. And whatever the hell me G is. I had to sort past a lot of that crap. But there's some weird stuff we found, mostly just some unused pillars, doors, and the juiciest piece of cut content discovered to date. There's like this shelving with some uh, dinnerware and kettles on it. And Vadi promised to delete all of his videos because of this massive revelation. So I described the actual hit point value for objects as being a sort of binary thing that just determined whether or not something was breakable at all. That's a reasonable way to summarize how it was used in Dark Souls 1, but if we were to change the values, this parameter is capable of more. By increasing it, we could make an object require multiple hits. So now it's not just a question of surpassing an object's defense, now there's also draining all of its HP on top of that. How it works on a deeper level, I'm not entirely certain. It's not as simple as every attack consistently draining a set amount of HP, as it seems something similar to individual frames are being counted. So for an object that has 0 defense and 20 HP, I might sometimes break it with a single roll. Or other times it'll require rolling twice, because of how long I actually got my hitbox to interact with it. Or I could give it incredibly high HP, but still break it with a single roll if I slow my animation speed way down, because of the prolonged contact. I just thought it was interesting that they never used this anywhere in Dark Souls 1, as there's never an object that requires multiple hits. Somewhere I think it would have made sense to appear would have been for the breakable wall in the catacombs. I can imagine a few bricks falling loose with your first couple hits. But this does pop up in the rest of the Soulsborne games, making Dark Souls 1 the odd one out. Even going back to Demon Souls, you had pillars in the Dragon Gods arena that took multiple hits to break. These had 3 defense and 80 HP, 
meaning rolls didn't get past their defense, so you had to do a real attack of some kind. And then from there, it was just a matter of draining that full 80 down to zero. But here's something to consider. If we look at its behavior in Demon Souls, the numbers seem to drain a lot more cleanly. The inconsistent damage caused by our duration of contact doesn't seem to be happening. So whatever system they used for draining HP was a lot tighter. This makes me wonder if they somehow broke this system between Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1, as it might actually explain why we don't find any objects that take multiple hits to destroy this time around. If it stopped working correctly after Demon Souls, they might have been shy about using it. This makes me wonder if this was ever even fixed. In the parameters for Bloodborne, we found that the breakable chests in the Chalice dungeons have 1500 HP. While admittedly I haven't done the research to see exactly how that drains, having much higher numbers than what we see in Demon Souls makes more sense with how the HP drains in Dark Souls 1, as you'd want to use some bigger numbers to make up for the way it drains there. And King Boar did check to see what was happening in Dark Souls 3, and found that the HP is still draining in a way that's similar to Dark Souls 1. Maybe this is all intentional, but it looks so sloppy and weird compared to Demon Souls. I honestly think there's a good chance that their system for draining object HP was accidentally broken for Dark Souls 1, and has never recovered since. I'd like to thank Zuli the Witch and Catalyst for providing the groundwork that helped me learn some of the things shown in this video. And a huge thanks once again to King Boar, who was kind enough to put up with me asking him to look at all the weird crap I was finding, and also for general research assistance. Links to all of their social media below, you should follow them if you like my videos. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider subscribing on YouTube or supporting my Patreon. I'm going to make another one of those silly screensaver videos, and there'll be a poll open for one week after this video goes live to help determine which area is done next. Next are special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. Curtis Ware, Eric W, Ethan Ross, Gary Marshall, Harry Pham, Carl Germ, Lazy Tangent, Lude Frago, Moon Magic Witch, Nashwan Azari, Nate Hines, Quinn Parsons, The Majalis Duo, and Zelther. And of course to the rest of my patrons as well, thank you all so much. And until next time, consider breaking some objects in silly ways.